Well, a very good morning to you again. It's great to be with you, and thank you for the invitation to join you today. And it's a great privilege to open up God's Word. Uh, my, my, my links with uh, your congregation go back uh, some years. Uh, when I was a student at Merlins, I came and worshipped uh, at Lansdowne quite regularly, particularly in, in my third year when I was allowed to uh, go to any church I wanted to go to. And uh, I was greatly blessed and encouraged uh, by, by uh, this congregation. You have changed a bit. So have I. But when I came out of uh, the Northern Irish subculture uh, and found myself here in England, it was a bit of a shock to the system, I have to say. And uh, I had to come to terms with a lot of things about how the English do church, do, do anything, really. And um, I, began, I began to realize, though, in, the, in that diverse community of, of, of Merlins, which I'm sure is still diverse, uh, the, reality, the reality and truth of what someone said uh, quite some years ago about why we in the UK and our different places love the gospel. The English love the gospel because it gives you something to talk about. The Welsh love the gospel because it gives them something to sing about. The Irish love the gospel because it gives us something to fight about. <laughs> and the Scots love the gospel because it's free. <laughs> So I know it's totally inappropriate to use those kind of stereotypes in a, in a, in a, in a service that's could, got to do with cross-cultural mission, but uh, there we are. Let, let's pray, shall we? Let's, let's still our hearts and ask for the Lord's help. Lord, we do, we do thank you so much for your word. We thank you for its, uh, its reliability and its relevance, and we want to pray for an attentiveness, and we would ask that with the help of your Spirit, you, you would help us to hear you clearly today as you speak through your Word, and help us to work this Word out in our lives, and, and as a church family, in ways that bring glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, you could turn back to chapters 10 and 11 of this uh, encounter between Cornelius and Peter, which I, I, I think many of us, most of us here today will know about this encounter. So we're looking at God's transforming mission and the message of reconciliation. Over the past 100 years, a huge shift has taken place in world Christianity. If we went back a hundred years ago, 80% of all Christians were lo located in Europe, North America, uh, uh, but today, uh, if we go to the next slide, 62% of all Christians uh, are Africans, Asians, Latin Americans, and Pacific Islanders. So there's been a huge demographic shift in the worldwide church. That picture there uh, was, was taken a few years ago in Calais. That's, that was a makeshift church that was erected at the camp in Calais. That's probably gone. Other structures have come and gone as well in all sorts of other places around the world. But that's how, that's how the church is growing, actually, in that kind of makeshift, flexible way but in the context of great upheaval and, uh, and challenge and difficulty. And it's no exaggeration, I think, to say that the beginnings of that gospel movement among people and communities all over the world today are to be found in, in this amazing encounter between Peter and Cornelius. It's such an important and radical encounter that it takes up two whole chapters in the book of Acts. Luke repeats the essentials to make sure we get the message. So if you're a really biblical congregation, you'll turn up again for the next service to hear this sermon a second time. <laughs> no, you don't have to do that. Yeah, but Luke, Luke lets his spotlight fall on, on Peter and Cornelius because I think he wants us to see that this is a really significant turning point for the progress of the gospel. 
But he also wants to see what a transformative moment this is, not just for the recipient of the gospel, but in the life of the messenger as well. And as we'll see in a moment, this encounter between Cornelius and Peter, it isn't just about the conversion of Cornelius. It's, it's, it's about the conversion of Peter and the church as well. There's, there's, there's a mutuality here going on. There's something very deep and radical happening, not just in Cornelius, but in Peter as well. If you go to the next slide, here's a quotation from uh, two South American authors who've written a superb book on sort of history of Christian mission. I commend this to you, to all nations, from all nations, a history of the Christian missionary movement. And they say, properly understood, the history of missions is not only the history of the expansion of Christianity, but also the history of its own many conversions, of what the church has learned and discovered as its faith becomes incarnate in various times places, and cultures. So today, what we're asking is, what does Peter's encounter with Cornelius say to us about how we should engage in cross-cultural mission? Here locally, and for OMF, wherever we work, but primarily, what what does it say to us here as a community today? Well, there's at least three things that I want us to see from these couple of chapters. And the first thing is, Remember, it is God's mission before it is ours. It's God's mission before it is ours. God is always ahead of us. He was ahead of Peter, who had no idea uh, that God was preparing Cornelius, or that he, Peter, would very soon be sharing the gospel with him and sitting eating a meal in his Gentile house. God is full of surprises in the book of Acts. Luke goes out of his way to highlight these surprises because he wants us to see that mission isn't about what the apostles were doing, but about what God was doing. And in the book of Acts, if you, if you look at the verbs of action in the book of Acts, a very high percentage of the verbs of action are associated with the action of God or the action of the Holy Spirit. In fact, it's not the church that's on the move in the book of Acts. It's the word that's on the move. It's the gospel that's advancing. And all the way through Acts, God is so often working contrary to the apostles' best estimate of what they think they're going to do next. And something happens, circumstances change, God steps in, the Holy Spirit works, And plans are in pieces, but God is at work. Isn't that that the case often in our own lives and in church life? I'm I'm staying with the Pickards, and over breakfast this morning, Dave and I were talking about strategy in the book of Acts and saying, well, actually, there isn't any strategy in the book of Acts. (laughs) It's very hard to see a detailed church strategy plan being worked out in the book of Acts. It's just full of surprises. So, in OMF, I meet many people who have ended up in countries and ministries they never thought they'd be in, doing ministries that they never thought they'd be doing at the outset. And all of us need to be open and ready for God's surprises. And those surprises are often good reminders that we need to keep God at the center of what we're doing. In all that we're seeking to do for the sake of the kingdom, we need to intentionally keep the Lord at the center. It's his work before it's ours. Chris Wright, in one of his books, has some good lines on this. He writes, all mission or missions that we initiate or into which we invest our vocation gifts and energies, flows from the prior mission of God. God is on mission, and we, in that wonderful phrase of Paul, are co-workers with God. So we ask, where does God fit into the story of my life? When the real question is, where does my little life fit into the great story of God's mission? I may wonder what kind of mission God has for me when I should ask what kind of me God wants for his mission. 
We wrestle to make the gospel relevant to the world, but God is about the mission of transforming the world to fit the shape of the gospel. God is always ahead of us. And one of the, the implications of, of really coming to getting to grips with that is that we, because he's always ahead of us and because he's always at work, it provides a great incentive to get involved in evangelism, to get involved in sharing the gospel because we know the Lord is at work. He's ahead of us. Some people take these chapters and this encounter between Peter and Cornelius, and they use this story to conclude that, well, since God was at work in Cornelius' life, here's an example of why you don't have to be involved in evangelism. But that is a misreading of this story. That's a misuse of this story. Yes, God related to Cornelius on the level of his own religious experience. Yes, Cornelius was upright and God-fearing, but he still needed to hear the good news, and not from the lips of an angel. An angel appeared to him, but the angel didn't share the good news with him. He needed to hear the gospel from the lips of Peter so that he could receive the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. So I want to encourage you to keep on with your evangelism. There are some church, there are, this, is, this is one of the hot potatoes that we wrestle with in parts of the UK church and in the mission agency scene. What is mission? What is our role as church communities? And there's all sorts of really good community stuff and social development stuff going on in mission agency and church life. But you know, if it doesn't have an intentionality to sharing the good news built into it, it's not biblical mission. And people might call this and that and the other holistic mission or integral mission, and I am a a big fan of, and I believe the Bible does give us a model of integral holistic mission. But if it's integral holistic mission without any intentionality to share the good news of Jesus, it's not integral or holistic mission according to the Bible. So I want to encourage you to keep on sharing the gospel. And there's a great need to share this gospel worldwide. Let let me give you some statistics. Uh, I'm not always convinced, I have to say, by the statistics or or the definitions that are used to explain the need for mission. But however you look at it, and these statistics here I've taken from what I believe to be reliable sources. And if you want to come and ask me, where do you get these figures from afterwards, I'm I'm happy to tell you. But there are around 17,000 people groups with virtually no access to the gospel. That that represents over 3 billion people, actually. In Asia, only one in 10 people knows a Christian. In East Asia, where OMF's focus largely is, there are 667 million people without access to the gospel. 114 million people speaking 1,636 languages have no access to the Bible, and as yet, there is no Bible translation project started in their language. So in terms of world mission, there is tremendous need The need is great. The reasons are convincing. The task is overwhelming. But we engage in mission from a place of confidence because we know we are co-workers with the living God. Hudson Taylor said, there is a living God. He has spoken in the Bible. He means what he says and will do all that he has promised. And God's heart is for the nations and his redemptive plan is for the whole of creation. And he sends his people, us, into the world as his co-workers to share this great message. So we share it and we, we get involved in mission primarily because it's God's mission first. And he calls us to accompany what he is doing and be partners with him and co-workers with him in this great task. And then secondly, what these chapters have to say to us is that we need to be prepared to move out of our comfort zones. Now, what will that mean? Well, it'll mean, first of all, being willing to change. 
it's clear in chapters 10 and 11 that God had to really push Peter into realizing that this good news of peace, the repentance that leads to life, now extends to all people everywhere without them having to become Jews first. So Peter's theological categories had to be expanded. And his ministry of sharing the good news had to be realigned with God's action and what God was doing. And that came about because Peter is told to go into Cornelius' space, into his world. Cornelius wasn't, wasn't to come into Peter's world, into the Jewish world, into the Jewish paradigm. No, Peter had to go into Cornelius' space. And very often in our evangelism, we expect people to come into our space, come into our church, to come in and engage with us on our terms. But these chapters in Acts and the example of Peter, they challenge us to be prepared to go out and to engage with people among whom our Christian vocabulary, our, our church structures, and our culture is really alien. But as we engage and go out into that space of the other, we begin to have this kind of encounter that Peter had with Cornelius. Our theological categories get expanded. Our ways of communicating the gospel get honed and challenged and sharpened. Hudson Taylor is famous for the way he entered the space of the Chinese in the 19th century. And this was a very radical thing at the time. He said, let us in everything on sinful become Chinese, that by all possible means we may save some. Let us adopt their costume, acquire their language, study to imitate their habits, live in their houses. How, how do we work this out? This is, this is, this is incarnational mission, witness, how do we work that out in 21st century Bournemouth? What does that have to say to the UK church today in how we try and engage with, with communities that are really far away from understanding what on earth we're up to here today? No knowledge of the Scriptures, no idea what the gospel is, don't know who Jesus is. How do we engage with that kind of culture? By entering that space, by engaging, by listening. So Peter obeys the Lord. He goes to Cornelius. He allows himself to be invited into the space of the other. And, and that step of obedience and vulnerability, which is a key thing in witness and mission, that step of vulnerability allows for this deep encounter that changes them both. They are both converted and changed in different ways. Cornelius comes to a living faith in the Lord Jesus. And Peter realizes that God doesn't show favoritism. His theological paradigm of segregation is blown apart. And the combined result of these conversions is that the church itself is taken to a different place. In the following chapters here in Acts, we see how the center of gravity in the Christian movement shifts. It shifts geographically. The Jerusalem church is still important, but there's a shift to Antioch geographically. There's also a shift missiologically because the Antioch church becomes a very multi-ethnic, multicultural, uh, mission-sending church. So when you get caught up in the, in the missional purposes of God, well, there's no knowing where it'll take you. There'll be surprises. There'll be, there'll be things that God does and circumstances that get changed and works of, of the Spirit in our lives and in our communities that really take us totally by surprise. And we're reminded again and again, this is God's work before it's ours. What a privilege to be involved in it. We don't know where it'll take us, but for sure it'll take us out of our comfort zone and, and challenge us to change. And secondly, not just to change, but, well, if you're talking about change, if you're up for change and you're working through change, then you've got to be prepared for handling criticism. Look at chapter 11, verse 1. It tells us the news spread about Cornelius' baptism. But then verse 2 tells us that Peter faced criticism. Have you ever, have you ever been criticized? 
You ever been criticized in church? <laughs> we don't have to go there. <laughs> Let me tell you about when I was criticized. One of the first, one of the first um, uh, instances that I can remember facing criticism uh, in Christian ministry was not long after I graduated from Moorlands, uh, or you say Molins. That, that, was, that was one of my cross-cultural experiences in coming to England, the thing about the vials. But um, when I left Molins, I returned, I returned to, uh, to Derry, or Londonderry, or Legendary, if you like. Um, I returned to Derry to, to be an evangelist with the London Derry Presbyterian City Mission. Just rolls off the tongue, that, doesn't it? <laughs> There's a culturally sensitive name for an organization. So I, I worked in Derry with a, with a group of Presbyterian churches, and I, I was in that role for a couple of years. And I got involved in lots of different things. And, and actually, uh, now that I think of it, my, my connection with, with your congregation and with Steve Brady in particular goes back to Steve Brady's ministry in Derry back in the 1980s. He used to come over to us and preach and be involved in, in, a, in a convention. Anyhow, I got involved in planning a, a weekend of evangelistic ministry. And uh, this weekend ministry was happening in predom- a predom- the predominantly uh, Catholic and nationalist area of, of Derry. We took over an, a, a cinema and we invited some people to come and, and be part of this evangelistic weekend. Uh, we invited Ian Coffey to come and preach. We invited the Salt Mine team to come and do uh, music and drama and all that stuff. And at that time, uh, Dave Pope, does that name ring a bell? He was, he was there too. Now, I was in charge of the publicity. So I thought it'd be a great thing to build this. I got these things printed, and I thought it'd be very, very good to print. This is all I could find. I found two halves of this. So, so I, I thought it'd be a great idea if we, if we build this as coffee with Pope. Now, if, if you know anything about Northern Ireland, and maybe even just something, a tiny little thing about, about Derry, it's a very divided city, and... Uh, and we were operating in the predominantly nationalist Catholic area. And these flyers and posters, which began to be circulated around the city, I began to get a bit of flack. And uh, I wonder, why would that be? And uh, <laughs> people, people said, look, I'm not too sure that you went down the right road on this. But it's too late to turn back now. Uh, and I had to live with it, and they had to live with it. But I learned some lessons from the whole thing. And it was a great weekend. And people came to know the Lord. And, uh, and, and the salt mine folk came back another time. And, um, but, you know, if you're going to do stuff in Christian ministry, you will get criticized if you try to be innovative, if you try to be creative and do things differently. Um, I found some, some uh, quotations from uh, editorials in the 19th century where Hudson Taylor was criticized heavily for what he was doing in China. He was criticized here in the UK for being an irresponsible leader because no single European woman had ever set foot in the inlands of China before 1870. And he started opening up things for women to be involved in, in China. And he faced uh, criticism from the officials of the British government and from the editors of newspapers like the Times and the Shanghai Evening Courier. And one of the biographies on Taylor quotes these editors. It is not to be born that an individual who has already by his stupidity produced serious political complications should be permitted to roam about the country preparing ill treatment for every foreigner who may be unfortunate enough to follow his route. One editor devoutly hoped Taylor would be admitted to the hospital for incurable idiots. The Shanghai Evening Courier said, this restless apostle is as difficult to lay hold of as a flea in a blanket. (laughs) He he got a lot of flack. Um, William Booth, Salvation Army, uh, his work among the poor was criticized by church leaders. Uh, The Earl of Shaftesbury uh, on one occasion announced that he thought the Salvation Army was the Antichrist. So the truth is, if you're going to try new things and be creative, sooner or later you'll face criticism. But we can learn from Peter here in these chapters, because when he's criticized, he doesn't leave the room. 
He, he doesn't reject the church. He doesn't go and set up his own organization. Instead, verse 4, he, he engages with those who've criticized him. He takes time to explain what happened. He gains their understanding and approval. He, he recognized this wasn't just about him. It was a key moment for the church, a new direction for, for, for the work of the gospel. So uh, uh, it's important that we stay connected to the church. That's an important lesson for many of us, I think. Those of us who, who are visionaries and creative and want to see things happen and stuff move. We have to be willing to change. We have to be willing to face criticism, but we've got to stay connected. Facing criticism can be difficult, but it's really important to involve the Christian community in order to take a new venture forward. Thrash out the issues. Seek to bring people with us. Endeavor to keep the church on board and together, together, discern God's leading for whatever the, the new work or vision God is calling us to, to, to take forward is. And can I just say also that I think it's important to shape the culture of our teams and churches in such a way that we give permission to people to try new things. Sometimes people try new things, it doesn't work out, and we, we, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we come down like a ton of bricks on people when they try new things and it doesn't work out. And I'm sure he won't mind me quoting him again, but I remember D David Pickard uh, saying to me some years ago when I interviewed him uh, for an OMF event that when he was leading his team in Singapore, he would say to that team, it's good to try, it's great to succeed, it's okay to fail. And I've said that to our own team here. It's, it's good to try. It's great to succeed. But it's okay to fail. And if we create that kind of culture in our organizations and teams and churches, I think we'll be releasing people to do new things, learning from the mistakes, but together seeing new things happen and new things take shape. Organization, organizational culture and church culture Ah, oh, well, that's a whole topic on its own, isn't it? But it's something we can work at, something we can intentionally try and shape to see the Lord's work move forward by His Spirit. So if we're going to engage in cross-cultural ministry, just to recap, whether, whether that's across the street or across the world, whether it's in the church life or an organizational life, this, the, this encounter, these chapters, they, they remind us that we, we've got to be prepared to move out of our comfort zone. And that means embracing change, handling criticism, and staying connected to the Lord's people. And I just want to add, I want to add another important point here, because moving out of our comfort zone, it, it will force us to rely upon the Holy Spirit. There are 56 references to the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. And the place of the Spirit in this encounter is unmissable. Un the work of the Spirit is found in clusters in the book of Acts. Uh, the story of Pentecost in chapter 2, the story of Stephen, chapter 6 and 7, Philip in chapter 8, and here in chapters 11 uh, and 10 with Cornelius. So this is at least the fourth outpouring of the Holy Spirit uh, so far in Acts. And Luke describes it in terms of surprise, but recognition of an authentic work of God in the lives of Cornelius and his household. And those, those twin responses of surprise and then recognition of an authentic work that, that's really uh, very often the way people react to the growing church around the world today. And, and around the world today, the churches that have seen the most significant growth are those that give central place to Christ's victory and the power of the Spirit. And those who are so often turning to Christ are people who are all too aware of the need for power to combat spiritual darkness, sickness, uh, 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 social injustice, spiritual darkness, and, and, and evil. There's an openness to the work of the Spirit. And I would say, from my own experience, Christine and I had worked in Malaysia for 10 years, and we'd worked in East and West Malaysia during those 10 years. And I would say that where there is an openness to the Spirit, combined with a love for God's Word and a passion for evangelism, there you have a dynamic community of mission. And we were privileged to serve in a church and in a denomination 
in East Malaysia that combined these three things. When we, when we first went to East Asia, before we went there, the field director said to Christine and I, just, just a wee word. Those people that you're going to be serving under and amongst, you're going to be seconded to a denomination, it's a little bit Pentecostal. Oh, you're from an Ulster Presbyterian background, Peter. How do you feel about that? <laughs> I said, oh, I'm sure that'll be grand. No problem at all. <laughs> well, it was a bit of a shock to the system because it, it was still rather different. <laughs> it was different from my experiences at Moorlands, and it was certainly very different from my Presbyterian church in Londonderry. But I learned a great deal. And I, and I was in a college in, 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 a, in a theological education context where I had students, students who had encountered the Lord in deeper, more profound ways than, than ever I could have imagined personally. These were people who had, who had experienced revival, whole longhouses in, in Borneo that had, been, that had come to the Lord, that had experienced the, a move of God's Spirit and the transforming power of the gospel in ways that Wow, I I had only read about in books. These people, I was the teacher in the class. These people, they knew it for real. But I'm saying to you today, this this openness to God's Spirit is key. But it also also says to us, it's not about our resources. It's not about the gifts and expertise that are in the congregation, the quality of our buildings, the the great resources we might have for understanding this, that, and the other, and doing all that we're doing. We've got to rely upon the Holy Spirit. I've, I, was, I was struck by some words by Brian Stanley, academic at the University of Edinburgh, has done much to research mission and church history. He writes, and he's talking about a mission conference that happened in Edinburgh uh, nearly 100 years ago, 1910. Lots of people came, 1,215 delegates, mostly men, mostly white, from the West, They gathered to talk about mission, and they looked ahead into the 20th century with great optimism about what was going to happen and how the church was going to grow and how the gospel would advance. Now, this was 1910. It was followed by two world wars and the upheaval that we all know about in the 20th century. But here's what Brian Stanley writes. The Christian faith was indeed to be transfigured over the next century, but not in the way or through the mechanisms that they imagined. The most effective instrument of that transfiguration would not be Western mission agencies or institutions of any kind, but rather a great and sometimes unorthodox miscellany of indigenous pastors, prophets, catechists, and evangelists, men and women who had little or no access to the metropolitan mission headquarters and the wealth of dollars and pounds which kept the missionary society machinery turning. They professed instead to rely on the simple, transforming power of the Spirit and the Word. And that's still the case today because it's gospel vitality is so often found in places of extreme poverty and flavelas, shanty towns, urban slums, villages in Africa, Asia, Latin America. They have no resources worth talking about. Instead, they rely on the simple, transforming power of the Spirit and the Word. But finally, we've got to move to the final point. These chapters here, 10 and, 10 and 11, they, they remind us that we need to engage in cross-cultural mission in such a way that we are proclaiming and demonstrating the radical reconciliation that's at the heart of the gospel. As, as this quotation says, here we are introduced to a stupendous sight, unimaginable in the ancient world, of a Jewish peasant under the same roof of a Roman military officer. You know, this is something powerful. This is something that we just don't get today. How amazing and how radical this coming together of Peter and Cornelius actually is. Uh, They demonstrate a radical reconciliation. Peter went into the house of a Gentile who was an officer of the army that was occupying his native land, an officer of the empire that, op- that oppressed his people with heavy taxes. The power of the gospel in bringing about repentance that leads to life is seen in how it brings reconciliation in the most profound ways, ways that testify to the good news of peace 
That's what Peter preached in Acts 10, 36. It's the good news of peace. Now, you and I know division and disunity within the church and within mission is one of the greatest obstacles to gospel ministry. But one of the most powerful aspects of our witness is the demonstration that we are a reconciled community and we have the message of peace that our communities and our cities need to hear and need to see fleshed out by us, the people of God. Some years ago, just a couple of years ago, there was a meeting of East Asian leaders in OMF. And in that meeting, that group were asked the question, what does the gospel mean for you? And a friend of mine, a South Korean leader, Joshua Kim, he got up and he said this, the gospel for me means Chinese, Korean, and Japanese Christians serving together in the same organization. Now, if you know anything about the history and even current relationships of those three countries, China, uh, Korea, and Japan, it's, it's a difficult history. And even for their peoples today, there are difficulties. But this, for Joshua, was one of the great self-authenticating, self-authenticating uh, signs of the gospel, that because of what Christ has done, he and his brothers from Korea or from Japan and China could work together in the same organization. Reconciliation and peacemaking. For us in OMF, very much, very much on the agenda in East Asia, whether you think of North and South Korea, racially fragmented Malaysia, uh, the inter-ethnic, uh, inter-religious violence in Myanmar, the insurgency in, in South Thailand, treatment of minorities in China, or divisions within and between churches themselves, this is such a powerful, relevant message for the world in which we live. So this double-chaptered story in Acts, it reminds us that sharing the good news in all its fullness is about proclaiming the Lord Jesus Christ as the peacemaker who transforms relationships and enables people to be his agents of reconciliation, enables his churches to be uh, communities that embody the gospel of peace and to replicate that in a thousand different ways in our communities and in our cities is what our gospel witness is really all about. So this week, whether the Lord is calling you to cross the street or cross the world, Say yes to being God's agents in his mission. Be prepared to move out of that comfort zone, to change, to be creative, and be God's agents of gospel peace in the broken places where he places you, even tomorrow morning. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this this record we have of Peter and Cornelius, thank you for the implications and the ramifications of this radical encounter, this radical reconciliation. And Lord, I do ask that you would please help us as a community of your people. Please help this congregation of your people to be used mightily as a witness to the gospel locally and globally. Send out from this place agents of gospel peace. Bring about that creativity and enable your people here to engage with others in a winsome way, in a radical way that points to Jesus and that 